Well, it's been a long time, Takahashi. For a series that's going to have four entries on the Famicom, it has been a while since that first game. The first game was released in September of 1986. That was Fami Daily episode 140, right at the height of the Famicom boom. Five years is forever in Famicom time, too. So what has brought Takahashi Meijin back to the Famicom after all this time? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but I get the impression that Hudson is finally pulling away from the PC Engine. Every game that Hudson releases for the Famicom from this point on are series that they took to the PC Engine and are now bringing back. In fact, just a week before the release of this game, Hudson released Takahashi Meiji no Shinboken Jima on the PC Engine, because this series wasn't complicated enough. That's the game called New Adventure Island internationally. Takahashi Meijin, as all Famicom fans should know, is the man with the 16 shot fingers. He was a Hudson employee who became the mascot for the company, known for his ability to rapid fire. As far as I've been able to tell, he did not go around the office only wearing a grass skirt. The original Takahashi Meijin no Bokenjima was a port of Wonder Boy. But the Wonder Boy sequels have already been ported to the various platforms under other titles, and so the rest of the games were totally original. Now I'm going to put this up front. I think I could make a good case that this is the best platformer on the Famicom since Super Mario Bros. 3. The plot of the game is that Takahashi's girlfriend has been kidnapped, again, and he's going to go get her back. There are eight worlds with eight levels in each of them, but you don't play all of the levels. When you complete a stage, you go to this bonus round, and what egg you collect determines what level you go to. After you've cleared enough stages for that world, then you go to the boss stage. The controls of the stage should be familiar. A jumps while holding down B will make you run. If you've collected an X from an egg, then tapping B will throw that. The big new addition here are the dinosaur friends. Nintendo couldn't get Yoshi to work on the Famicom, but Hudson somehow managed it. There are four different dinosaurs that you could ride on, and you get them by collecting the cards that you find in eggs. The spade is the red fire dinosaur. Hitting B will make it spit fire, and it can walk on hot surfaces. The heart is the blue thunder dinosaur. It can shoot a spark from its tail. The diamond is the aquatic dinosaur. You can still ride it on land, but it doesn't do anything there. In the water, however, it lets you move pretty fast. And it's the only dinosaur that can swim. The club is the flying dinosaur, and after you jump into the air with it, you can just steer around freely. Hitting A will make it bomb enemies. In between stages, you can see what you're currently equipped with, and put things away. So if you're riding a dinosaur that isn't appropriate to the stage, hit B, it'll go back into your inventory. If you're in a stage and you switch dinosaurs or get another of the same card, those also go to your inventory. Something to be aware of as you ride the dinosaurs is that you're eating for two. Returning from the first game is that power meter. It's not a health bar, it's more of a timer, and you have to keep eating in order to fill it up again. While you're on a dinosaur, it runs down twice as fast as normal. That meter always gives these games a certain tension. You could take things slow, hunting for power-ups and destroying every enemy as it comes at you, but you might not have enough time for that. There are a lot of hidden eggs on stages. You can find them if you hit the spot where they'd appear, and you crack them by standing there and jumping. Usually these will contain a key that will take you to a hidden area. This could be a big dinosaur that gives you an additional power-up or extra lives, a warp zone that will let you skip to the next world, or a bonus area where you bounce on springs to collect food and possibly cards. The stages aren't especially long in Takahashi Meijin no Bokenjima 2, but they make up for that by being vicious. The first world will go pretty easy on you, but soon you'll be running into stages where they just don't put any food in them, or nastier jumps with plenty of obstacles. The difficulty ramps up relatively quickly here. Fortunately, you have infinite continues, though they do take you back to the start of that world. And if you need it, because this is a very long game, there is a cheat code that lets you select what world you're going to begin from. Just like the previous game, Takahashi is fragile. Touching any enemy will kill you, unless you're on a dinosaur or the skateboard where you don't stop moving. 
In that case, you lose what you are riding on. If you manage to reach a boss, then the power bar goes away. You have as much time as you need to defeat them. You also get off the dinosaur, who will fight on their own in the battle. Their effect can range from just what you need to totally useless. If you die on a boss, then the boss moves to one of the stages that you didn't clear, and you'll have to clear both the stage that you're at and that additional stage. Although this is a well-regarded game in Japan, it didn't sell a whole lot on release. Still, Hudson must have been satisfied since they went on to make two more sequels on the Famicom. They also made a Game Boy port of Takahashi Meijin no Bokenjima 2, and that version is surprisingly close to this. In fact, the Game Boy version outsold the Famicom version. Obviously, I like this game quite a bit. Although it is pretty difficult, the controls are really tight, and so it never really feels unfair or frustrating. And the dinosaurs add a lot of fun to the game. Deciding what, if anything, you want to take into a level gives the game a bit more depth. The big catch here is that I like the sequels even more. But this is a really exceptional game that's often unfairly overlooked. <laughs>